J. Krishnamurti, at the outset of his life's work some 40 years ago, said that his only concern was to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. In his talks, Krishnamurti is asking for a particular kind of participation on the part of the audience. He is not giving a predetermined lecture to which the audience listens with agreement or disagreement. He is not presenting a point of view. He is not doing propaganda for an idea, belief, or dogma, or leading the audience to a particular conclusion. Instead, the speaker and listeners together are exploring human problems. Krishnamurti was born in South India. At the age of 16, he was brought to England where he was privately educated. He began to speak along his present lines in 1929 when he repudiated all connections with organized religions and ideologies. Since that time, Krishnamurti has continued to travel the world, writing, speaking, and discussing. He is the author of many books, among them The Urgency of Change, Freedom from the Known, The Flight of the Eagle, and You Are the World. The following talk was given at Ojai, California, on April 9, 1972. with what we were talking about yesterday. We were saying that mere physical revolution has very little significance. And what has meaning and depth is the psychological revolution a total change in one's attitude, values, and behavior. Either we change superficially, adjusting to superficial demands, or we go much more deeply into the whole structure and nature of consciousness, where the revolution must take place. That's what we were more or less talking about yesterday. I think we ought to go into it much deeper this morning, bearing in mind Depth, the word depth, has no measurement. It is really immeasurable. And the more one goes into it, the deeper, the wider, the unfathomable it is. But we must begin with order. Order, it seems to me, is not a mental directive or a disciplined conformity or the effect of constant battle within oneself or outwardly. Order has its own law, and if we are at all serious, and one should be in a mad world, in a world that is crumbling about us, in a world that, is, that has become almost insane, sanity is essential. Sanity is order, and this order comes about naturally without any effort if we understand what is disorder.
And as we said yesterday, we are together considering the matter. You are not merely listening to a speaker, conf- uh, accepting or rejecting his words, but rather we are together taking a journey in the investigation, into the investigation of the whole process of disorder. That is, we are trying to communicate with each other what is disorder, trying to understand together what brings disorder in our life. And in the understanding of that, naturally order will come. Order, then, is not a blueprint, a a design which forces the mind to conform, but rather the understanding of what is the nature and structure of disorder. All right. It's a lovely morning, isn't it? Our lives, the life that we lead daily, not the ideological life, not the life of what one should be, but the life of what is, actually, every day. In that everyday life we lead a disorderly life, a life that's contradictory, that is self-centred, that has innumerable values, imaginative, contrived, remembered. Please, as we said yesterday, and if I may repeat again, use, if I may suggest, the words of the speaker to observe yourself, to look at your own daily life, actually what it is, not theoretically, not in abstraction, but actually as it is taking place in one's life. If you observe and are aware of your life at all, one sees that there is a great deal of conflict, struggle, contradiction, comparative competitiveness, both psychologically and outwardly. And these are the contributing factors of disorder, that is, Human beings are conditioned according to the culture they live, according to the country, the environment, the economic situation and so on. This conditioning may vary from China, India, Europe and America. In this conditioning we live, and in that life there is this constant struggle. Constant adjustment to certain values projected by society or by oneself or values 
that we have inherited and so on. The factor of disorder is essentially the contradiction in oneself, saying one thing, doing another, thinking something totally different. And this contradiction must inevitably create disorder. That is a simple fact, psychological fact, as when there are two nations opposing ideologies and religious outlook, must inevitably be in contradiction with each other and prepare for war, as it has been going on through centuries. That again is a fact. Now, either we change superficially, bring certain kind of order outwardly through legislation, through law, through politics, economic adjustment, and so on, or we understand the nature of disorder in our souls and see, as we explain what is meant by seeing yesterday, in that very perception is the ordering of our life without any effort. I think this needs little explanation. You see, as we were saying yesterday, perception is of the highest importance. Either you perceive through an image, and therefore you don't perceive at all, or you perceive directly. And the perception which is direct has immediate action, because goodness doesn't flower in the field of time. You understand that? I said just now, goodness doesn't flower in the field of time. Time being not only postponement, but conformity to an idea to an ideology, to what should be, the gradual idea of getting better, all that is in the field of time. In that field there is more conflict, there is no goodness, and goodness can only flower in the field in which Time doesn't exist at all. Have, have we communicated with each other? No. <laughs> have we? Wait a minute, sir. You can ask questions at the end of the talk. Because when the house is burning, you have no time to put it out. You don't say whether he's a long-bearded gentleman who put, put on, in, began the fire, what colour, and so on. You act instantly. There's no time involved. And our house is on fire. You may live in this beautiful valley or live in a country where there is plenty but yet your house is burning and we must act immediately. And action can only take place 
when you see actually the nature of disorder in your in one's own life, which is causing such havoc in the world, because what you are, you project that in the world. And seeing the truth of that is to act immediately. And the immediacy of action is goodness. Right? Please don't agree or disagree. Don't remember this phrase about goodness. But actually see the truth of it, see the reality of it, the beauty of it. Not tomorrow, but as you are sitting there listening, if you are at all listening, see actually one's own life in such mess, confusion, contradiction, great deal of sorrow, pain, not only physical but uh, psychological pains and frustrations, that whole life of ours which we call living. As we said, Either we bring superficial order and therefore adjust to certain ideologies, symbols and so on, or you go into the whole structure and nature of consciousness of yourself as you are. And that's what we are going to do this morning a little bit. This is not group therapy. This is not a confession. This is not an analytical process. Analysis to me is postponement. It has no reality. I can go on analyzing my life for the next thirty years till I die, and I'm still analyzing at the end of it. Analysis implies time. Analysis implies the analyzer and the analyzed. And therefore there is division in that, and therefore conflict. So we are not analyzing nor is it group therapy, nor are we do, doing a propaganda. Propaganda is always furthering a lie. Right? You all accept all this, don't you? Quite easily. Why is that? Either you don't understand what we are talking about, or you understand it and therefore it is natural. What we are going to do together this lovely morning is to observe ourselves clearly as we are, using the words of the speaker as a mirror. Either the mirror distorts or the mirror shows exactly what is. There is distortion only when you say, I don't like or I like. This is my opinion or judgment, this is right and this is wrong. This should be or should not be then distortion takes place. If you belong to any particular society or to a particular group 
or conditioned according to Catholicism, Protestantism, you know, all the rest of the divisions of various religious sects in the world, and being so conditioned, look at the mirror, then you are distorting. Distorting the fact of what is. Whereas if you look without opinions, judgments, evaluations, or being aware of your conditioning, putting at that aside and observing, then there is no distortion. Then you and I are observing exactly what is. You know, to observe needs a great deal of energy. If you want to observe that tree very closely, you have to attend to it. You have to give your mind and your heart to the light on the leaf, to the shape of the trunk, to every movement of the, of the branches. You have to give your whole attention to it. But if you are vaguely looking at it and your thoughts wandering off, then it's a wastage of energy, the wandering off, and therefore you not, do not have the sufficient energy to observe. Is that all right? As we said, either we observe that bird, We observe without an image or with an image. The observation through an image is a wastage of energy. And you need energy to change what is. And we are going to investigate together what is. Now we are divided consciousness as the conscious and the hidden. Conscious, the conscious mind and the un unconscious mind, the subconscious and so on, all the various divisions. We are familiar with the conscious activity of the mind, what it thinks, the various jobs it has to do, the automatic habitual activity, the everyday events, actions that have to be carried out. Then there is all that movement which is hidden. which is the unconscious, the deeper layers of the mind. Now, to bring about a radical revolution in the whole consciousness which is necessary in order to produce a quite a different kind of civilization in which there is man can live with peace with another man without conflict, one has to look at this whole content. No, either one brings about superficial order at the conscious level, or one brings about, through mere observation, order (coughs) 
whether order is within consciousness or outside of it. I wonder if you are... Is this all too complicated? Bene, may I go on? Look, we are trying to bring order on, don't we? Within consciousness. That is, we try to analyze, we try to conform, we try to discipline, we try to change the pattern of our thought, of our existence, and so on. Within consciousness. And consciousness is the content, is the content. Consciousness cannot exist without its content, right? And we are trying to move the contents in different places and hoping thereby to bring order. Whereas order exists outside consciousness. You understand, the first proposition, first perception, seeing that the content is consciousness. You have no consciousness without all its content, your thoughts, your ideas, your hopes, your despair, your sense of frustration, and all that is your consciousness. And in that consciousness you are trying to bring order. And order cannot exist in that consciousness. Order can only exist outside, at a different dimension. Now, how is it possible to reach or to come upon that dimension. Right, you follow? I realize if I am in that state, I realize that my life is conflict, both outwardly and inwardly. I realize that my consciousness, the me, is its content, the furniture, the attachments, the sense of possession, the desire for power, position, prestige, status, pleasure, fear, all that is my consciousness. And I am trying to bring order in that consciousness. And I see that's not possible. There is order only outside that consciousness and the mind must try to find out what that, what that different dimension is. Right? First of all, I see my life is of fear, enormous amount of fear. My life is guided through fear and pleasure. Those are the true central facts of, my li- of, your, of one's life, pleasure and fear. They are the two sides of the same coin. May I go on? Hmm? There's lots more to talk about, that's why I want to get on with it. And I hope you can follow all this. If not, I'm sorry, I can't help you. (laughs) So, one's life is based on these two factors, pleasure and fear, and what we call love. 
Is love pleasure? Is love desire? Or is it something entirely different? And also I must find out what is death, because that's part of my living. So my one's life is pleasure, fear, love and death. And within that field, I am not mind is not only trying to bring about order, but also it wants security within that field. Because the brain cells can only function efficiently, totally, effectively when it is completely secure, whether it can be secure neurotically or secure in freedom. I do not know if you have not noticed the neurotic people are secure in an idea, in a belief, in a concept. To them that becomes the very essence of security. So, when the mind seeks security in an idea, it is neurotic. Do you accept that? Do you see it? Or when it is find security in a belief, in a dogma, in a concept. It finds security there, but it's a neurotic security, because it essentially divides people. And seeing all this in one's life, the conflict, the misery, the sorrow, the fear, the anxiety that comes about when one has the ideological faith in something, the despair, the utter sense of frustration, That's our life. And we are frightened of death. Old age, disease and death. That is the whole living of our life. And being afraid, we believe. Being afraid, we have faith in something. Being afraid of death, we have various theories. Believe in reincarnation, resurrection, you know, every form of hope. And that is our daily life of disorder. Now how is one to bring about order in this disordered world, which is myself, which is yourself? How is one to live a life that is completely orderly, without any contradiction? I think that is what most of us want. The more sane, rational we are, the more demanding that our life be rational, healthy, moral, righteous, and not finding it there, 
then we invest not only our money, but also our hope in churches, in myths, in various doctrines, and all the imported exotic religions, Krishna consciousness, all right, various forms of yoga, various forms of meditation. When something of that kind is imported into this country, you ought to immediately export it, because you don't know a thing about it. You are a lot of gullible people. All that you want is experience, which will give you pleasure. And you have tried drugs, and you are quarrelling over marijuana, and you are quarrelling over something else, because all that you are concerned with is the furthering of pleasure in experience. And therefore that brings more disorder in your life. So what we are going to do now is to see whether the human mind, your mind, the human mind, can radically change. You will say then, what, wh what is it, how is it important if one individual, one human being changes, how can he affect the whole world? You know, if you were changing, if you were actually were changing, you would never put that question. It's only the person who is not changing wants to find an excuse for not changing and says, well, what, what good will that do if I change? What we are trying to do here this morning is to understand and talk or see the significance of total change. As we said, order doesn't exist within the field of consciousness. If you see that clearly for yourself, then you will ask, how is the mind, which is so disorderly, so corrupt, so petty, shoddy, how is that mind to come upon something totally different, at a different dimension altogether? Is the question clear? You understand my question? Now, when you put that question to yourself, that is, one lives in disorder. And one sees any form of movement of thought in that field will further disorder, right? Therefore, one says, how is the mind, which is so <coughs> chattering, which is so active, which is so endlessly imagining, remembering, contriving, how is that mind to bring order? Hmm? Have you got my, the question clear?
Now, to bring order, to bring about order, the mind must be completely silent. Right? And that's where the importance lies of meditation. You know, that word has been brought from, this, from India, and there are various forms of meditation in this country. And I'm, we are going to tear them all to pieces. seeing what is false in all of them. When you see what is false, you see the truth of it, and therefore you will never touch it. Because the whole idea is, mind must be absolutely quiet to bring about order within itself. Because to look at that tree, if your mind is chattering, you can't look. You can only look completely if your mind is quiet. That's simple, isn't it? That means you must give your whole attention to it. Attention being not only seeing the significance of the look, the understanding, the intelligence, all that is implied in being completely attentive. Otherwise you cannot possibly see anything or hear anything. You know, when you love music, you listen, don't you? You listen to it with your heart, with your mind, with your body, with your eyes, with everything that you have. Otherwise you are not a musician, you are just enjoying sound. So, you can observe only when the mind is completely still. You can see another only when your mind is quiet, when your mind is not filled with images. Then you can see another and be totally in communication with another. Silence is necessary to listen. You understand? That is the central factor of observation, to see clearly the mind must be completely quiet, and your body too, the whole structure, your mind, your brain cells and your nerves must be totally quiet, otherwise you cannot see clearly. Now, that is the fact which you and I understand it fairly simply. Then the question arises, how is the mind to be made quiet? You understand, that's the next natural, normal question. That's a wrong question. And, there will, and in that you are caught. You yourself see that when you listen to something, when you see a beautiful mountain, a tree, a bird on the wing, your mind must be totally quiet. You see that, you understand, you do it. And you say, if I could make my mind so quiet, then everything would be simple. 
Then you ask, how is it to be made quiet? When you ask that question, there are all the gurus, the teachers, the um, students, the prof professionals that says, I will teach you how to be quiet. Right? You are following all this? So they have a system. As I said, we are going to tear all this to pieces to find out. You may belong to all of them. Probably you do. You have got your own system of meditation or system of this or that. And we are going to look into all that. System implies a goal, an end, and a means to that end, doesn't it? Please listen to this carefully. There is the Christian method, the Hindu method, the Zen method, the various methods, including the transcendental method. Method being a means to an end, the end you, ha you have projected. You have projected the end, calling it enlightenment, God, whatever it is, whether you have projected it or your guru or your teacher or your priest, they have projected it for you, and you accept it. And then they offer you the, system, the method to achieve that end. The end is your projection. And when you practice the method which promises the achievement of that end, it is a process of self-hypnosis. Got it? You know, I used to know a man, for twenty-five years he practiced meditation, nothing else but that. He left his family, went off into the woods, lived a monastic life and meditated. And unfortunately, somebody brought him to a, one of the talks in which a, the speaker was talking about meditation, amongst other things, and pointed out that every form of uh, this form of meditation with a system and a, an end is self hypnosis. He came to see me the next day and he said, We are perfectly right. Twenty-five years I have practiced meditation, and now realize that I have wasted my life. You know, that requires a great deal of perception and vitality and energy to acknowledge something that is not true that you have been doing. So, then there is this imported transcendental meditation, mantra yoga. You know this? Do you, some of you do that? Or you are ashamed to acknowledge it? <laughs> As I said, you ought to import or export immediately all these things. They are wastage of energy. They bring illusion. You know the whole idea of mantra yoga, which is ma transcendental meditation in this country. The whole idea, idea is that through a repetition of certain words, first verbally, loudly, then silently, and after reaching a certain point, you take off. 
whatever that may mean. You can repeat any word, but it's more romantic if it is a Sanskrit word. If it's a word or a series of words which your teacher, your guru gives it to you in secrecy, you pay for it and you think you are going to get heaven. You do get heaven but it's your heaven invented by you. And they are also adding now a new kind of yoga, which is Kundalini yoga. You have heard that too, I am sure. Don't touch any of these things. They are most dangerous. That is, if I may tell you. But if you enjoy illusion, if you enjoy being in a state of hypnotizing yourself in the name of God or enlightenment or truth, go to it. And there are various forms of disciplines, practices, all promising what you want, which is enlightenment, happiness, truth and so on. That is, you want more and more wider experiences because you are bored with your daily life. But you see that only a silent mind can observe. Only a silent mind can bring about a complete order. So when you for yourself see the truth that no system, it doesn't matter who says it, that any movement of thought must inevitably bring about a division and therefore conflict. When you see the truth of all this, your mind becomes quiet. To see the truth of all this is to have a quiet mind. You understand this? So you see, our difficulty is knowing we live a disorderly life, we are incapable of bringing order into it, because we want order according to our contrivance. We want order according to our imagination, according to our pleasure and convenience. And in that field there is no order at all. If you see that, and to see that you need a quiet mind. You, under you understand? A further thing, which is what is there more, or what is not more, what is reality? Is there something which is not put together by the mind, by thought, by imagination? Is there something which is not measurable, which man has been seeking for thousands and thousands of years? You understood my question? Man has always asked, 
from the beginning of time, knowing that his life comes to an end, knowing that he is always endlessly in conflict with himself and with the world, and knowing that he cannot bring order into that, then he asks if there is something beyond all that. In that very asking he is escaping from his own life. You understand? We are not escaping. We, are, we see order is necessary. That must be established. Then you can ask the question, after establishing, laying the foundation of behaviour, righteousness, order, then one can ask the question, is there something beyond all this? You are following me? Am I making myself clear? Now how is one going to find out? You can believe in something. You can believe that there is something which is beyond time and thought. Belief is not an actuality. You don't believe that the sun is shining. It is shining. It's only when you do not know, when you are not, when you haven't understood, when it isn't in your mind, then you believe, then you have faith in something. So, to find that out, mind must be free totally from belief. Mustn't it? Belief implies fear. There is your belief, another belief. Belief divides people. So the mind must be free. free from fear, which has created all our conditioning, both physical conditioning as well as psychological conditioning. So can the mind be free of fear? Fear exists only in the movement of thought. Right? And from that, from that realization, it says, can thought be quiet? Thought functioning logically, sanely, effectively, in what direction? And completely quiet in another direction. A thought creates fear. That is, you are living now and there is death. Death is sometime in the future, or perhaps tomorrow, or far away. Thought says, I am afraid of that state of which I do not know, therefore I am frightened. Fear is, as pleasure, the product of thought. If you see the truth of that, not intellectually, verbally, then fear comes to an end. So freedom is absolutely necessary to find out if there is something beyond all this confusion, mess, ugliness, beauty, you know, this thing that we call living in which we try to bring order, which we all serious people do bring order, so that they behave righteously. There must be freedom. Freedom is not what to do what, what you like. Freedom has responsibility.
freedom implies order. And in that freedom, because the mind is demanding freedom, that very freedom brings its own discipline. That is, the word discipline means to learn, not to conform, not to suppress, but to learn. Learn what is, not about what should be. So freedom from fear, freedom from every form of belief. And there must be freedom of not belonging to a, a, a group. You understand? Freedom from following, from accepting a teacher, a guru. Freedom not to follow. Therefore, freedom from authority. You understand? The authority of law is one thing, and the, author and the author psychological authority and the acceptance of authority psychologically is another thing. We are talking about the psychological authority. Because you are afraid, therefore you follow somebody. You want enlightenment, which is your projection, therefore you follow your guru or whatever the gentleman or lady is. So there must be freedom from authority, from fear, from belief. Which means that you are completely alone. not isolated, because when you are alone, then you are directly in relationship with another. Like a beautiful flower, it is alone, may have other flowers similar to it, but it is so beautiful it is alone. What is beautiful is always alone. It is only such a mind that can come upon this thing that is immeasurable. That has no name, that cannot be put into words, because of what is described, what is the de the description is not the described. The word is not the thing. It's only a mind that has understood this whole phenomenon of living and is able to sta understand itself. It's only such a mind that's completely free and quiet still that can come upon this extraordinary thing that man has thought through millennia. Can, would you like to ask questions about this? Yes, sir. If I'm free of fear and my mind is quiet, would I be looking for anything? If my mind is free from fear <coughs> and is completely quiet, would I be looking for anything? If my mind is quiet, free from fear, would I be looking for anything? You see, you have put a question, which is not a question at all, 
are not being rude to yourself. When you say, if I get, if I am in a state of no fear, then will I be seeking anything? But you are not in a state of not being afraid. That's a supposition that has no reality, right? It's like by saying, well, if I was, a, if I was the Queen of England, I would be do this, but I'm not the Queen of England. So there is, you put an impossible question saying, if I am that, then what shall I do? But first, sir, be free of fear, and then you will know whether you are, whether there is something to seek or not. Then there is no such thing as seeking. Do you know what the, what that word means to seek, to search out, to find out? You know what? That, that's the meaning of the word, to seek. Now you are seeking. What are you seeking? And how do you know that what you find is the real? How will you know what you find may be a false thing? So, to find out in your search what is true, there must be recognition, mustn't there? Right? You are following this? I must recognise in my search that is the truth, or that is the false. Now, which means recognition implies something I have already known. So what I am doing when I am using the word seeking, I am only seeking what I have already known. You, f you follow? Therefore, don't seek, but be with what is. You see, sir, look, there is fear. Of that we all know. Fear of death, fear of old age, fear of yesterday's pain being repeated. Fear of public opinion, fear of being dominated, fear of not being loved, fear. We all know that, fear of loneliness. Now that's a fact. Now, what takes place when there is fear? You want to go beyond it, you want to conquer it, you want to suppress it, you want to escape from it. When you escape from it, when you want to suppress it, when you try to conquer it through courage and all the rest of it, you are wasting energy, because the fact is fear. That is what is. Now, if you don't escape, but actually see the fear, then now what takes place? You are following all this? Now look, there is fear. I don't escape through any form from actual fact that there is fear or envy. Now, how do I recognise that it is fear? How do I know it is fear? Because I have had similar reaction before. Right? Otherwise I couldn't recognise it as fear, would I? Are you following all this? Or are you getting tired at the end of an hour? So fear, when I say it is fear, it has already occurred, it has already happened before. And when I say I am afraid, I am only strengthening what has happened before. Are you following all this? So can I look at that thing which I have called fear non-verbally? You have got 
You've got fears, haven't you? Haven't you, sir? You have, obviously. Otherwise, you won't be sitting here. And can you look at that fear without escaping from it? Just look at it. Don't analyse, which is another form of an escape. Don't say, what, is, what has caused that fear, which is another wastage of energy. But to look at it without any form of escape, that means you have energy to look, haven't you? Because you are not escaping, you are not wasting energy through escape. Right? So there is fear. Now, how do you look at it? Verbally? That is, has the word created the fear? You understand what I am saying? Oh Lord! Has the word fear created the fear? Or is there fear without the word? The word being the memory of the fear which you have had before. Oh, come on, sirs. Be quick, get on with it. Wait a minute, please look. I am afraid for various reasons. Death. I am afraid. I am not escaping. Not escaping by saying, I must conquer, I must overcome it, I must do this, I must do that. So I do not escape. I am facing the fact as it is. Now, is the fact the result of a word? The word being the memory of a previous fear? Or is this fear something totally new and therefore non verbal? You understand this? How do I look at it? Am I looking? through the word or without the word. If I look without the word, is it fear? That is, now I have complete energy to look, and when I do look with total energy, fear is not. I do do this, so you will see. Take envy, of which you are all familiar. Envy is comparison, measurement. Please listen to this. Envious. You look so nice, you are so beautiful, you have got you are intelligent, I am dull, I am stupid, you are much better than I am. Hmm? You are a success, I am a failure. You are this and you are the comparison, measurement. And that is envy. Now can I live without envy, which is without measurement? Comparing myself with another. The other may be the hero, the god, the saint, the, the, exec, the chief executive, or whatever he is. Can I look? Can I live without any form of measurement? To find out, I see people are envious. And uh, one realises one is envious. Then one begins to rationalise it. If I if I am not envious in this world, I'll be destroyed. Which is a wastage of energy. Because I'm confronted with the fact that I'm envious. And the whole social, religious structure is based on this envy. <coughs> 
and through envy I'm trying to find out the immeasurable. You understand how stupid we are? So, can I live without measurement? I don't rationalize, because <coughs> when I rationalize, I can find excuses to be envious. <coughs> can I look at that feeling which I have called envy without the word which evokes or strengthens that feeling? Is the word is the memory. The word is <coughs> the symbol of the past. <coughs> <coughs> and when I look at that envy, I am looking with the eyes of the past. And so can I look at it afresh? And I can only look at it afresh when I have when there is no escape, when there is no excuse, but look at it with all my energy. Then you will say <coughs> that this thing which I have called envy comes there is no such thing. Have you understood this? Not understood it verbally, but actually do you read? <coughs> yes, sir. So first you must look at the images that come between you and fear. Right? You must look at the images that come between you and the inner water, which is fear. And then when you've understood that the images <coughs> prevent you from looking at fear, then the mind will be quiet and look at fear. <coughs> The question is, <coughs> to look at something the tree, <coughs> you or another, there must be no image. Right? <coughs> How is the image formed? And can images being formed be prevented? You understand? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> How is an image formed? What is the machinery that forms an image? Have you noticed when you listen to somebody, your wife or your husband, your friend, <coughs> completely, you do not form an image? <coughs> when you are giving complete attention, <coughs> About him, 
his insults, his dominance, his irritability, his pleasant phrases, his bullying, and so on. I have formed an image about him, because I have formed that image in order to protect myself against him. And my relationship with him is through that image. And he <coughs> has an image about myself. He has an image about me, and I have an image about him. And our relationship is between these two images. <coughs> And I have created this image in order to protect myself. Right? Isn't that the fact? That you have an image about your husband, your friend, your wife, your neighbour, your God, your. Hmm? in order not to be hurt, in order to survive, in order to live a life which is not conflict. You follow? You isolate yourself through your image. You know why you have formed it. Now, can that image forming be stopped? The machinery which forms the image, can that machinery come to an end? I'll show it to you. Please do it as we are talking. That is worthwhile, not taking it home and throwing it overboard afterwards. We have understood why the machinery operates. The, the image making becomes important, both outwardly, inwardly, at conscious level as well as the unconscious level. The desire to protect oneself, not to be hurt, because we have lived a life of being hurt. From childhood we are hurt. Don't you know what it means to be hurt? And you don't want to be hurt anymore. So you protect, resist. The image is the resistance. Right? Now, how does that come into being? Can that machinery be stopped? It can be stopped only when <coughs> you pay complete attention to what is being said, at the moment of what is being said. Have you understood, sirs? You insult me. You call me a fool, an ass, or whatever you like to call me. A great man, or a oh, marvelous this or that. And when you call me a fool, I pay attention to that. Complete attention. Not react. Not say, oh, you are another. <laughs> but just be totally aware of what you are being called. In that state of attention, there is no image making. It is only when you are inattentive the image is formed. Have you understood this? So do it. Then you will see you will never be hurt. It's only when you have an image about yourself as somebody or this or that, then you are being hurt. You know the word innocence means not to hurt or be hurt. 
Latin word no share comes from that, which means not to hurt or be hurt. And you are hurt when you resist, when you have an image about yourself. And the image making is to protect yourself against harm, against hurt, against <coughs> every form of intrusion. And when you see that, you give attention to what is being said, total attention, your mind, your heart, your brain, everything attend. In that state of attention there is no hurt and therefore no image making. And such a life is really a life of beauty, a great joy. Uh, what do you mean by not justifying or condemning or identifying? What do you mean by justifying, condemning or judging? When one is jealous, you know that w what it means, don't you? Or is it something new? You all know it, don't you? <coughs> when one is jealous, one justifies, doesn't one? It's right to be jealous. She or he belonged to me. It's mine. And, it's, and you justify that jealousy. You say, she shouldn't have done this or he shouldn't have done that. You are envious of that person and you rationalize it, that is, explain it so as to strengthen your jealousy. You like jealousy. You justify it. You recommend it. You say that is part of love, don't you? Part of love to be jealous. Lovely, isn't it? And that's what we mean by living a disorderly life, where you justify the injustifiable, where you condone that which cannot be condoned. How can love and jealousy exist together? But that's our way of life, which we have accepted and we justify it. That's what it means, sir. Isn't that enough? It's half past twelve.